Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I run through the current status of my sermon for this Sunday. Last Good Friday, while many of us were in church, there was a debate going on in Ontario, Canada that was greatly anticipated. It was Dr. Jordan B. Peterson and Slavoj Žižek who were going to debate happiness, capitalism versus Marxism, and everyone was geared up for a big fight because here you had a world-famous Marxist scholar and a world-famous capitalist anti-Marxist scholar, and they were going to debate whether or not capitalism or Marxism will make you happy. And everyone expected a brawl, the kind of brawl you see on Portland streets with Antifa, but a theological conversation broke out. One of the big moments of the evening, in my opinion, was when Slavoj Žižek, a noted atheist, cited his favorite Christian theologian, G.K. Chesterton. He said something to this effect. Even though he's an atheist, in other religions you have a God up there. We fall from God and then we try to climb back through spiritual discipline, whatever, training, goodness, so on and so on. The formula for Christianity is a totally different one, as we, philosopher, as we philosophers um, would have, <laughs> as we philosophers would have put it, it's a little bit of a transcript, as we philosophers would have put it, you don't climb up to God. In God, you are free in a Christian sense when you discover that the distance that separates you from God is inscribed in God himself. That's why I agree with those intelligent <laughs> uh, theologians, should I say theologians, um, like my favorite Gilbert Keith Chesterton, who said that this, the cross, the superfiction, the crucifixion, is absolutely unique because in that moment of Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani, God the Father, um, he's, Jesus cries, um, Father, why have you abandoned me? For a brief moment, symbolically, God himself becomes an atheist in the sense that you know where, um, in the sense of you know, you get a gap there. Again, this is a transcript from him. And that something is so absolutely unique, it means that you are not simply separated from God. Your separation from God is part of divinity itself. Now, just uh, Thursday evening, our Sacramento Jordan Peterson meetup had a road trip to San Francisco to hear Dr. Peterson, and he was speaking uh, for the Independence Institute on the reality of individual sovereignty, but one of the notable moments of the evening was he kept coming back to this G.K. Chesterton quote. It is sticking in his mind. It is... He is mulling it over. He is, he is trying to get his head around the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, now Zizek is, is playing with the quote a bit. It's, I looked up the real quote, and it's a little bit different, but it's less than you might imagine. But basically the heart of this is that suffering is so bad that God would be tempted to doubt himself. And that gets expressed in, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, Though, is it God's goodness or his existence that is on trial here? I think it's his, his goodness. And the question revolves around God's privilege. And these, these two issues merge psychologically, God's goodness or God's existence. The problem of evil's more cynical sibling is the notion that God doesn't care. We worry that God, if there is one, exercises his privilege by, by avoiding... Ah, there's a problem in the slide. We worry that God, if there is one, exercises his privilege of avoiding our bad neighborhood and abandoning his problem children, which are us. Think Matt Damon's movie Elysium, where the, the wealthy and the privileged live in a satellite over Earth, which has been devolved into chaos. Meanwhile, in Portland, they are fighting in the streets. May Day celebration turned into a brawl between Antifa and other people. And, well, there you have it. And, of course, there's video up on the Internet, and off we go. Because Americans think that morality and justice are self-evident. This was demonstrated in Kristen, Smith, in Kristen's, Kristen Smith's book, Soul Searching, where he did this massive survey of American youth. The difficulty, of course, is 
if in fact morality and justice are self-evident, why can't we agree on it? We agree that gravity pulls things down. We agree that we can walk easier in light rather than darkness, but we can't agree on justice. It's hardly self-evident to us. And this, of course, is an old story. You can go back and read Plato's Republic. And, you know, thousands of years ago, they were debating the same issue there. What is justice? Give each man or woman their due. But what is their due? We all imagine, well, I deserve better than this. And when people disagree, it just comes to quarreling and fighting. And if so, of course, then we have the political solution, which is, well, let's establish a state. And the state will become a virtual god. People are in a perpetual state of war with one another. So in order for people to have a chance, the state needs to have a monopoly on legitimate violence. And that's, in fact, what's really happening in the streets of Portland. Will the state take control of the violence, or should we punch a Nazi and do as we feel against those we feel are, are evil around us? And so then we make the state a god to hopefully keep a lid on things. But does that really solve our problems? The wars continue between states and between people groups. There are civil wars, there are tribal wars, there are terrorist grievances. And in a secular age, there is just no God who will decide between the disagreeing parties and settle disputes forever. All justice must be served in this world, we imagine, in a secular age. And as Miroslav Volf pointed out during the civil war in Yugoslavia, what that means is, if your enemy is evil, you'd better kill him now. You can't wait for God to judge them. And what that means is that we pull up hell every time we try to bring down heaven. Now, maybe Jesus is too soft, in your opinion, to deal with any of this. Jesus always kind of seems a little bit zen and a little bit floaty and, you know, hanging out with sheep and saying nice things and tolerating everyone. And that's, that's sort of the image that we have of Jesus here today. But as we saw last week at the beginning of the book of Revelation, the Jesus, the Son of Man that shows up there, has, well, his the hair on his head is white as wool, his as white as snow, and his eyes are like blazing fire, his feet like glowing bronze furnace, his voice like the sound of a rushing waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars. That's the that's you know what happens here below on earth. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. This is part of the reason the Jesus of the book of Revelation is not just sort of rolling around in the green grass playing with a bunch of sheep. The book of Revelation, God reveals himself and... Right away in the beginning of the book with the letter to seven churches, God's expectations are higher for the church. In a letter to small, seven small struggling churches, what is revealed is not really so much of a soft therapeutic voice. Most churches get something of a warning about their shortcoming. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Should God talk this way? You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. What does he mean by that? What kind of fire has this gold been refined by? And white clothes to wear. You'll notice in the book of Revelation, often those who wear white are dead. So that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see, because they're blind right now. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. He's knocking at the door. To the one who is victorious, I give the right to sit with me on my throne. What? I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. What's this Jesus talking about? Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. After I look, and you'll notice here, the door and throne imagery continue. But now a door opens, and we see what's on the other side of the door. 
After I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. This is a vision of heaven, and it's kind of like a dream. The, the pictures don't match, but they evoke, and they communicate, and they, and they move us deeply. And the voice I first heard speaking to me was like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what, mu what, what must take place after this. At once I was in, in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbles and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third with the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. There's a creature in the book of Ezekiel with these four faces, and these, these animals seem to represent strength and power and seeing and wisdom all in their own way. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, like the seraphim in the book of Isaiah, was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Remember that the book of Revelation is a compilation of all of the prophetic books, plus Jesus. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Remember, this was the cry of the seraphim in Isaiah 6. Who was and who is and who is to come. This is something that's being repeated throughout the book of Revelation. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worships him who lives forever and ever and lay they their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and, and have their being. For those following the Jordan Peterson stuff, there's a lot of God number one right here in this in this message then i saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals and i saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it now this is shocking because we just had the 24 creatures, the 24 elders, and the four living creatures all talking about the worthiness of the one on the throne. What on earth would that one on the throne be lacking? Certainly the one on the throne is worthy to open the scroll. And what is this scroll? And, and why does John weep? I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Now if you dash ahead, you'll see that What's on the scroll are the events of the world. These are all written down, and, and scrolls and books in the Bible have imagery of, of telling what is to come, and sometimes they're, they're sealed up, and sometimes they're read, and it all unfolds like reading a novel. It's the unfolding story of justice and redemption. Heaven and earth are at an impasse. Heaven can walk away, and earth can destroy itself. And the one on the throne needs something or someone else but 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 who or what else besides god himself can actually address these problems you see the exercise of, of removed authority won't resolve the messy injustice of earth will the author of life assert its privilege i should say his Will the author of life assert his privilege to exclude himself from our problem and leave us to ourselves or each other's competing versions of justice and vengeance? Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now what you'll notice in the book of Revelation is these two image are being, images are being played off 
each other. And and again, in our in terms of our literalistic representations, we can't capture this because the lion and the lion is the symbol. Now remember, these are these are Israel is a pastoral people, and so lions when they'd hear the lion in the in the thicket or hear him of ways off, you can hear a lion roar if you've ever heard a lion roar. They're they're fearful because they know that the lion has power to come and grab. But lambs, lambs are what lions eat. So, so what's this image of, of lion and lamb? He's the lion of Judah. And he's the lamb of God. And he's, he's both of these things. See the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has triumphed. But how has he triumphed? Has he triumphed like a lion? He is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. Why? Then I saw a lamb. So he, he heard about the lion, but then he saw a lamb. Because he's actually a lion, but he looks like a lamb. And, and that's why this Jesus is so surprising. We're, we're, we're expecting Goliath, and we get a victim. Looking as if he had been slain. Standing at the center of the throne. Dare he go there? Can does the one on the throne? And and again, you'll notice it's it's they're, they're switching back and forth. It isn't it isn't laid out like our world. Again, it's more like a dream. It's like a vision. It is a vision. He's at the center of the throne. This lamb who is a lion, and he's been slain. What what kind of victor is slain? I don't like my I don't like my champion slain. Well, then you won't like him. At the center of the throne, encircled by the floor, living creatures and the elders, the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. The number of perfection he can see everywhere. You think, well, what kind of lamb has seven eyes? But you're missing the point. Which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Wait, I thought he was at the center of the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. This means we participate in this drama. They sang a new song. This is, this is, this is something new. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal because you were slain, Philippians 2. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels Numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousand times ten thousand, they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. But remember, this is what they were doing for the one on the throne, who, who in that moment couldn't open the scrolls. And now... One on the throne can, because he has suffered, and because he has because he has come down into this world and become our victim. Zizek sees this. Peterson sees this. See, we lack the integrity and the credibility to bring justice to ourselves. And when we, in the best case, use the state to implement justice, it is never beyond critique, suspicion, or now the postmodern cynics charge that it was only a game of privilege to preserve some particular group's power. But this ultimate claim of privilege is addressed by the one who has complete privilege and the absolute opportunity 
and justification to walk away from us because we are the problem children. We are the ones who rebelled and took his creation. So what is God's solution? Tim Keller in a wonderful sermon quotes Albert Camus of all people. Believe it or not, Albert Camus understood that. In this amazing piece of writing, Camus says almost in almost these exact words, Christ the God-man suffers too. Evil and death can no longer be entirely imputed to him because he suffered and died. The night on Golgotha is so important because the divinity ostensibly abandoned its traditional privilege and lived through to the end. Despair included, doubt included, abandonment included, the agony of death. Do you doubt the existence of God or the goodness of God because of suffering? Well, there is a God who knows he did not exclude himself. It is not just identification with, it is not just allying with, he does not say because I know how you feel, because he took a further step and Easter left the tomb. His resurrection turns a dead end or merely a metaphor into a path to life. Justice seeking in this age mostly fails. And you don't believe me? And you thought you were the pessimistic one. None of us gets out of this age alive, my friends. Jesus invites us into the open door. If you live like him, you will die like him. And you will be raised like him. That is the promise of the gospel. Now. On the evening he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.